and um, Eric will let people um, join as they as they come on. And I want to thank everyone for being here. I feel like it's been a while since we've seen each other. Um, and I want to welcome again, Mr. Jeffrey Fleming, Executive Director of the Huntington Museum of Art. He is back by popular demand. We had such a great discussion and presentation in December, was it? I think it was December. I can't remember the exact month. But um, the group just so enjoyed you, Jeff. That they wanted you back. So here we are about six months later. So I'd like to introduce you. Um, as I said, Mr. Fleming is the executive director of the Huntington Museum of Art. He was born and raised on Long Island, New York. He attended Mary Washington College in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where he completed a bachelor's degree in historic preservation with a focus on architectural history and museum studies. While there, he was a recipient of the J. Benford Walford Scholarship in Architecture. In 1997, he was accepted into the prestigious Arts Administration Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. As part of his studies, he wrote an extensive thesis on the history and development of museum stores in the United States. Formerly the director of the South Hole Historical Society in South Hole, New York, he now serves as executive director of the Huntington Museum of Art in Huntington. In the past, he has served with regional, several regional committees and boards, including as president of the Long Island Museum Association, chair of the NYS Documentary Heritage Program Committee for Long Island, editorial board member of the Long Island History Journal, and as historian for the Village of Head of the Harbor, New York. Today, he serves as a grant reviewer for the Kentucky Arts Council, as an accreditation reviewer for the American Alliance of Museums, and as an emeritus trustee of the Brent, Brent Brecknock Hall Foundation. He is the author of two dozen books and catalogs documenting the art and history of America, including a shared aesthetic arts artist, artist of Long Island's North Fork, Charles Henry Miller, N.A., painter of Long Island and Irving Ramsey Wiles, N.A., 1861 to 1948, Portraits and Pictures, 1899 to 1948. He is the recipient of a 2017 Samson Foundation grant to support the writing of a monograph of the Bay Shore Long Island paintings of the noted American realist painter and Ashton School founder William J. Glackens, 1870 to 1938. Wow, that's a lot. And we are so um, fortunate to have you as our museum director. And we are going to turn it over to Mr. Jeffrey Fleming. And again, thank you for being here with us. Yes, morning. thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, could you ask uh, them to uh, allow me to uh, share screen? Oh, yes, Eric, and, and everyone else, please um, remember to mute while uh, Mr. Fleming is speaking until we get into our question and answers uh, session. I'm going to mute you should myself. be good. Okay, thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Well, I think we're going to pick up where we uh, left off last time. We're going to talk about upcoming exhibitions again here at the museum, as well as some cool new items we've acquired for the collection since we last spoke. Um, so it, it's, it should be a, a fun uh, uh, talk today. So let's start with upcoming exhibitions at the museum. The museum hosts anywhere between 10 and 18 shows a year, depending on the year. Some are short, some are long. We're trying to reduce that number a little bit just because we hear from our constituents that they miss shows. They don't get to the museum often enough to capture them all. So uh, going forward, we're gonna try to have a little bit longer runs for a lot of shows, which might make it easier for visitors like yourselves to uh, come up and see them. So the first one I wanna talk about that's coming up is the Sarah Wheeler Charitable Trust Exhibition. And uh, uh, Steve, Wheeler and his wife, Sarah, who are shown at left in this wonderful photograph, uh, were residents here in Huntington. He was an engineer from Ohio, uh, and he ended up divorcing his first wife and marrying Sarah, who is quite a bit younger. Uh, but they're both very interested in art. They were both accomplished artists. And in fact, we have a, a work by Steve uh, in the collection here at the museum. But when Sarah passed away, she left a trust, which benefits the museum. And it helps to fund the acquisition of paintings pre-1940. Could be anywhere in the world, but all, ha all have to be pre-1940, which was sort of a love uh, of her and her husband's. And so that's been around for, I think, about 20 years now almost. And at right is the very first painting we bought with this fund. This is uh, Charles Webster Hawthorne's Old Sea Captain. And uh, Hawthorne was an American artist. He's particularly noted as being 
uh, uh, the primary instructor up at the Provincetown Art Colony in the early 20th century, uh, where he uh, was a very clever artist. He wanted to make money doing this. In addition to his fees, he organized a art supply shop in Provincetown, uh, which was the only game in town. And so they had very high prices for artists to buy goods from. So he and his brother could do very well. So, you know, you know kudos to him for bringing in American capitalism into his, uh, his project. But the old sea captain is a wonderful uh, figural painting by Hawthorne. And that's what he's known for, sort of portraits and, and figural uh, works. Um, just joins another Hawthorne we have in the collection at the museum, which is part of the Daywood collection. Uh, we've used this fund to uh, enhance our holdings of women artists in particular. And here are two I wanna briefly talk about. At left is a 19th century still life painting by the uh, artist Eliza B. Duffy. Uh, she was involved in Philadelphia and in Southern New Jersey, but she's really an interesting character because uh, at the time that she was working, uh, she uh, wrote a lot about and pushed for women's rights, especially that women should have uh, their own activities outside of the home, which was not very common at the time, and that husbands and wives should share all the housework. It should not be all left to the woman to do this. And uh, so she was very vocal at the time, which was unusual in the mid 19th century from when this painting dates. At the right is a wonderful uh, still life by Blanche Lazelle from 1918. Blanche Lazelle is one of our great West Virginia women artists. Um, she also studied up in Provincetown with Hawthorne. This is a, a still life from a period after she had uh, visited the the great modernism show in New York in 1913, organized at the Armory. And her work's getting, you can see, a little more abstract, done with dabs of paint, not as impressionist. And in the 1920s, she's gonna to travel to Paris, France, where she's gonna become even more abstract after experiencing <laughs> the work of artists there. Another nice work in this, uh, that will probably be part of this show is going to be uh, Virginia Evans' uh, painting of Cold Spring Harbor, another woman artist from West Virginia. She actually got a grant to study at the Tiffany Foundation up on Long Island, New York, where I am from, and did this lovely impressionist view in the 1920s of Cold Spring Harbor along the North Shore. We were very lucky enough this past year to purchase this painting. Uh, interestingly enough, from the collection of Mr. Tiffany's former chauffeur, who used to work with the artists and help them. And for that, they were very grateful. And he would often be given paintings by those artists. Uh, and many of them stayed in the family collection until uh, <laughs> recently. So this was a very uh, a neat acquisition for us uh, uh, to, to acquire. Another woman artist, uh, Anne E. Rector. This is Third Avenue, New York City. Anne was from Parkersburg, West Virginia. Uh, went on to study uh, on the East Coast of the United States uh, up in New York and became a favorite of John Sloan, who painted no fewer than at least two or three portraits uh, of, uh, of Anne Rector. Uh, I think two of which are in the, uh, a large museum on the East Coast. I'm trying to remember the name of it now. I think it's the, it's the museum in Delaware, uh, which holds the Sloan archive. But a, a wonderful painting of, that depicts almost 30 different figures uh, on a street scene in New York City. And you can see this wonderful little boy in the foreground in his little orange cart and the little girl pushing her doll carriage. It's really a wonderful view of 1920s um, New York City. Anne would go on to actually join with her mother who had a design company in New York City and would run that. And they actually became pretty famous after the war for their uh, furniture. Uh, basically mirrored and glassed design furniture. So a really cool painting. It's quite large. It's one of my favorite acquisitions of the past couple of years because it fills that era of looking at sort of what was going on in 1920s New York, as well as bringing more West Virginia artists back into, the, back into our collection. So just a really neat uh, work. In terms of other types of works that are by male artists, we have, a, we have two here that I'm gonna show. On the left is Lockwood de Forest's On the Nile. And this has a great connection to the Tuma Near Eastern collection at the museum, which we're always adding works to. 
Uh, Lockwood DeForest was another New York artist, but he did extensive travels in the far Near East. And we held a show of his work about five years ago here at the museum. And we we're very lucky that the owner of this painting wanted it to go to a museum. So it was actually heavily discounted to us if we wanted to acquire it. So we definitely made the jump to uh, purchase this wonderful sunset painting on the Nile. And then at right is a great painting by Samuel P. Dyke of a view in West Virginia, which we bought about a year and a half ago, I believe. And Dyke was a Philadelphia, Pennsylvania artist, but often did views in West Virginia. And being able to acquire one of his works for the collection was really neat. And in fact, we were this, this painting was actually sold about ooh, 10 or 20 years ago at auction. And we were able to buy it this time around at a far reduced price from what it originally sold for us. So we always love doing that, getting deals for the museum and bringing interesting West Virginia artworks uh, back to the state. Uh, here's a, a work that we bought um, with um, money from the Wheeler Trust a number of years ago. This is uh, Thomas Hart Benton's Mind Strike. This is the image at the right. It's actually a ink and watercolor. And it is the uh, work that the print on the left, the famous lithograph of the same title, um, was created for. And we actually own both of these works. We own the original painting as well as the print uh, in our collection. And Benton, of course, is an extraordinarily famous American artist known for his wonderful sort of uh, WP era paintings of America, uh, especially in the, uh, the Midwest where he was from. But he also uh, was involved in several scenes in West Virginia, this one in particular, um, which was also created as a small oil study as well. Now, the next show that's coming up that I want to talk about is the Vogel Collection show, and the Vogels are shown here at left. They are a very interesting uh, set of characters. And what they did is they were very interested in art. They were New York City residents. She was a librarian uh, for the Brooklyn uh, Library, and he was a worked in the post office. And they had such a great love of art during the uh, mid 20th century, they decided they would live off of her salary and buy art with his salary. And they started buying art which they could afford, which was a lot of new art, American modernism and minimalism, and went even so far as to reach out to new young artists coming up in the art world. And even when they were having a tough time, not only buying their artwork, but occasionally hosting them in their apartment. They eventually, over a, a huge number of decades, built a collection of almost 5,000 works on paper, uh, both prints, drawings, paintings, and decided in the end to give the bulk of that collection to the National Gallery in Washington, DC. But as part of that project, they also did uh, an activity called 50 Artworks for 50 States, which the Huntington Museum of Art was part of, where they gave 50 works in their collection to major art museums in each state. So those works would be available just beyond Washington, DC. And our museum was lucky enough to be the museum chosen in West Virginia to get those 50 works. And so there's just wonderful, uh, interesting modernist and minimalist works in the collection. The one shown here at, at right is Edda Renoff's Furrows Number no. Five. Uh, and to me, it, it almost looks like uh, bacon in black and white in a frying pan, but it's actually meant to resemble the furrows on the earth. Um, and so that's one of the works that, uh, that is in that collection. We also have here Nancy Arlen's sculpture, Dorothy. Uh, Arlen uh, is quite a famous artist and did these wonderful works that are done in these resins and plastics with a mix of color. At right is Robert Mangold, the famous uh, contemporary artist. Uh, this work untitled is, uh, is a drawing on color pencil on paper. Uh, here we have Linda Banglis's Untitled, uh, which is actually a wall sculpture. Uh, and she is known for working with um, these other materials, more like uh, cast materials as well as felts. I think this one is a felt sculpture. And at right is a, a drawing in mixed media about Stuart Hitch, an untitled work. Hitch died as a very young artist and his work is really not that common today. Uh, but again, wonderful to see all these modern works, which it's hard for our museum to acquire um, because a lot of our funds are restricted to um, more older works as well as uh, paintings. So it's great that uh, we got this, uh, this gift at the museum because it enhanced our drawings 
and sort of modern uh, art collections. Another show which is going to come up this fall is the Huntington Sesquicentennial Show. So as most of you know, this year is, celebrates our 150th anniversary as a city. And so we're going to be featuring works that sort of represent and talk about Huntington history from the museum's collection. And up first here, we have a bust by Anna Hyatt Huntington, Huntington the famous uh, female sculptor from New York. And it's a portrait of Collis P. Huntington, who of course, as you all know, founded our city and for whom we are named after. Um, Huntington was looking for uh, a terminus for his CNO railroad. He tried to make a deal with uh, Guy and Dot about bringing his railroad there and they said, uh, no way, because Guy and Dot was the little settlement in this region. So he, he looked next door and said, yeah, you know what? I can buy all that land next door and build my own city. And so that's exactly what he did. And uh, so that's how we get Huntington, West Virginia. And this portrait of uh, Collis B. Huntington was actually donated to the museum by Anna Hyatt Huntington. And believe it or not, we actually have a black and white film of her arriving at the museum in her big town car to deliver the sculpture in person, which is that's a pretty neat thing for us to have. So it's a great bust, wonderful sculpture. Uh, Anna Hyatt Huntington is uh, really well known for her sculptures of animals and of female nudes. And we have example, some examples of those in the museum in addition to this wonderful bust of Collis B. Huntington. Next one up I wanna mention is this uh, early painting uh, by an unknown artist called the Ensign Foundry in East Huntington. This is a painting that dates to the early 1870s. And it's a view from across the Ohio River towards part of what would become Huntington. It's East Huntington. And so what we have there in the foreground right along the river um, here is the Ensign Foundry, which made the, uh, the, the bases for the railroad cars. Um, uh, and then in the background, we actually have another factory that was also involved in the construction uh, of uh, implements related to the railroad. And you can actually see right here, here's one of the little railroad engines zooming by in the background. And also in the background here are the beginnings of Marshall College, which would later become Marshall University, uh, all of which were located in, uh, uh, in East Huntington. So really neat painting. It's one of the earliest views of our area. There's one earlier uh, that's a view actually of Guyan Dot uh, done uh, uh, years before this one, which is not in our collection, but is held in a private collection in Huntington, which we hope to one day have in our museum collection. Here are two more objects relating that relate to Huntington. On the left is a Huntington China Company of sample designs. As you may know, Huntington had a lot of china and glass factories in it over the years. And the Huntington China Company uh, uh, was one of those entities. And here uh, is what you can see, it's the one of the plates and it's got multiple designs around the edge of the different finishes you could choose that the factory could create for you. Um, and, uh, and so it's noted that uh, that these could be applied to the dinnerware, finished with their gold finish, and that uh, you were to reach out to Mrs. Pretty of Oakland Avenue in Huntington about these designs if you wanted to commission a dinner service uh, for your table. On the right is John P. Rieta's Continuous Ascent. This is a maquette for the sculpture that's located downtown at the Civic uh, Audit Center. Um, and uh, Rieta was actually a very popular sculptor in the 70s, but died very young. He died at the age of 39 and while he was in Italy. And uh, we're very lucky to have this small miniature uh, of the larger sculpture that uh, is in downtown. Another show which is going to be coming up uh, in the next uh, year is American Paintings. And so I want to uh, show you guys a few of the wonderful American works that, that might be part of this show. This is John Russling Meeker's Morning on the Ohio River. So this is a great scene from our region from uh, 1878. So not long after Huntington's founding, uh, but a wonderful uh, painting done in the Hudson River tradition. Uh, Meeker was really well known for his Southern works, particularly down in uh, the New Orleans area 
uh, uh, in the American South. But this is a wonderful painting uh, done here in our region, but further uh, up on the Ohio River where the, the height of the bank and the cliffs get much uh, taller as opposed to in Huntington. Here's another work which might be part of this show. This is Guy C. Wiggins Union Square, Winter, New York City. Uh, Guy Wiggins was an American Impressionist painter, uh, known in particular for his winter scenes of New York City and his views done in Connecticut. What's wonderful about this painting, uh, which shows this busy scene in Union Square about, right about 1913, is that in the background, you can see all these buildings going down along the edge of Union Square. And we are able to identify nearly all of them going down the way. And we can particularly date this painting to about 1913 by this building here, which was a Nickelodeon that existed in that particular spot at that time period. Uh, a Nickelodeon being a, a small movie theater where for a nickel you could go see uh, shorts as well as films. Uh, but it's really interesting because many of these buildings are identified which help us date this painting. In the foreground is the, uh, the monument to George Washington, which though in the square still is not on this corner anymore, it's actually been moved since this time to the other corner uh, of Union Square. And one of the things I wanna point out also about this painting is if you look along the perimeter, you're gonna see a line of almost sort of a brown color. That's because what Wiggins did after he painted his painting is he applied this white wash to simulate, simulate snowfall uh, over the surface of the painting, um, which is why it has this sort of soft, more subtle tone to the surface. Um, it really is a wonderful uh, image uh, showing the busyness of the square with all the people and with these wonderful trolleys uh, moving around that uh, we don't actually have in New York City anymore. So really a great painting, one that we acquired just a few years ago from a private estate that was selling it and which we were very happy to secure for the museum. Now going from Impressionism to really a modern work. This is a painting by Werner Drews or Werner Drevis, the, uh, the Bauhaus artist. Um, and this very modern landscape of the Delaware Bridge. Uh, Drevis came here to America. He settled um, uh, in our country and created these wonderful paintings as well as uh, woodcuts and different types of prints that he became famous for. He had originally studied at the Bauhaus and did a lot of work in the uh, area of stained glass design. And we were able to purchase this painting, which dates to 1940, as well as several early of glass designs by Drevis, uh, which are uh, descended directly in his family and are now part of our collection. Several of them were featured in the recent Bauhaus exhibition that we held at the museum. Uh, and so, you know, it's really great to include these wonderful modernist works. Um, this, of course, dating right to the point where we would have to normally cut our uh, painting acquisitions off with most of our funding, uh, but we were able to get it and we're, we're very happy to have it. Uh, another show, which I only have one sort of work to talk about today, is our Latin American Roots show. Uh, this is an area that uh, we have in the, in the collection. Uh, several of you may have saw several years ago, we did a show based on the wonderful uh, paintings we have from Mexico and South America, uh, which feature uh, the saints and their little retablo paintings, which were done and collected by a, a family in Huntington. But we're also going to be including in this show modern and contemporary works. So here's Jesus Rafael Soto's F, which is a large print that we acquired um, about two or three years ago through the generosity of funding left to us by our former curator, Louise Poland. Um, and we bought a lot of wonderful contemporary print work with that uh, money, this being one of those works. And so this is gonna be a way we can showcase uh, some of the wonderful Latin American art in our collection that we don't often get uh, out um, uh, into the, um, the, the public sphere. So watch for that show. And the last show I wanna talk about just briefly is one we're doing with Marshall University. And this will be the Marshall Art Faculty Exhibition. 
Um, the last one we did was several years ago because we alternate shows between uh, exhibitions featuring the work of WVU's uh, art department and Marshall's art department. And so the last one you would have seen would have been about three or four years ago, and that was the WVU show. So upcoming uh, in this next year will be the show with Marshall's uh, art department, uh, which will feature all kinds of different artworks uh, created by members of the art department, uh, which it, uh, will probably be a really wonderful show. We're just sort of starting to work with them on this um, because that show isn't until uh, this November through uh, early February. So um, we look forward to seeing what they uh, sort of curate out of their own uh, artworks because it's always sort of curated by the department of what will be shown uh, when it comes to the uh, museum. So again, watch for that. As I said, I don't have any additional images of that show, but I think it's gonna be uh, a great feature to show what our, uh, uh, what the members of the art department have been doing over the past uh, several years uh, in the positions in Huntington. Now, since we've last talked, I'd like to just briefly touch on acquisitions. The museum is always looking for new art to add to our very large collection. We have a number of different funds which allow that. The Wheeler Trust, which we talked about at the beginning of my talk is one. We also have uh, monies left to us by Winslow Anderson, the noted glass designer, which funds the acquisition of Haitian artwork and artwork that relates to his career and love of more modern and uh, folk pieces. We also have funds that support the acquisition of works on paper, uh, as well as uh, Asian works of art. Uh, we also have a fund provided by our former docent, Donald Harper, which funds the acquisition of all types of artwork uh, and conservation, though we tend to focus that on supporting the acquisition of more contemporary works relating to the Walter Gropius Master Artist Program. Uh, which is our great program of bringing world famous artists to the museum who do a lecture, they have an exhibition, and they do a two to three day workshop on site, which allows regional artists to study with master artists from around the world. Um, so we're, that we're really pleased that Don Harper did that and hope that other docents and supporters of the museum down the road will fund other similar funds so that we can continue to expand the kind of artwork that we can bring um, to the museum. So let's talk about uh, works that we've acquired recently from the Gropius program. This past uh, pandemic year, as part of the Bauhaus exhibition, we held a connected exhibition of ceramic artworks uh, by six contemporary masters. Uh, and in addition to that, we also decided to host a symposium, which was supposed to be held at the museum, but instead we actually had to do it online as a digital presentation. Um, each artist uh, created a presentation which was launched at a particular time and day online, showing how they work within their studio, which was a way we could offer uh, programming for other ceramic artists around the country and the world uh, that we couldn't do because of the pandemic. So um, in this exhibition uh, where this artwork was featured, we decided to purchase a work by each of the artists or pair of artists that participated. So the first here on left is a wonderful ceramic bottle by Bandana Pottery by Hunt and Dalgleish, uh, really a wonderful tall, thin, a contemporary work. On the right is a wonderful bucket by the artist Linda Christensen, uh, shown in more of a, a natural uh, uh, ceramic finish. Here's another work by Justin D'Onofrio called A Covered Jar. It's a very large work, and you can see how it's sort of layered down on the surface and it's finished entirely in a, in a matte black finish. Um, which is a, is a neat work for uh, the museum to acquire. And then two others at the left, Sanam Imami's storage jar, which is decorated these wonderful sort of floral motifs on more of a, 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 a sort of a, almost like a salt glaze ground there. And then a huge work by the noted uh, ceramicist, Chris Justin called Cloud Jar, which is this wonderful form 
uh, that looks almost cloud-like the way it undulates. Um, what was wonderful about the online presentation that was part of this acquisition is that normally for this symposium, we would have had 50 people on site who would have able, been able to participate with these artists. Since we did a digital upload, many more people were able to participate. And what I can say right now is that those videos are well in excess of 100,000 views online, which is an incredible number of people uh, being able to look at that, um, that program that we would never have been able to have done on site here in Huntington. And it continues to grow on a monthly basis. Uh, I'm waiting for it to top 125 and 150 and maybe 150,000 uh, views because uh, it, it really is an amazing result uh, from something we were forced to do because of the pandemic of sort of going online uh, in a way that we had not done before. So uh, I think this is really neat. Uh, this is a new work that we've just acquired and which we don't even have at the museum because we bought it from an exhibition where it is hanging now and we won't get it back for quite a long time. This is Amy Casey's Forest of Uncertain Things. And it is a work, uh, a nice size work that you can see is very surreal in its interpretation of, 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 of what things are. Because we have this wonderful sort of forest landscape, but most of the forest has been cut down. And then in juxtaposition in the painting are all these sort of buildings that are falling and tumbling at the right. So I sort of wonder when I look at this work, is it about what happens to forests when, it, when humans cut them down and create this cavalcade of buildings at right? It really is a, is a neat painting. And we were very fortunate to get this work because uh, normally it would been difficult for us to purchase, but a member of the museum really wanted us to have it and basically gave more than half the cost to buy it if we could come up with the other uh, portion of the money. So it's really neat because Amy Casey is a contemporary artist doing a lot of wonderful things out there. And uh, so we look forward to when this uh, painting will actually come to the museum, which I don't even think we're gonna see it till next year. I think that's how long it's off in this exhibition uh, down South. So, but we look forward to uh, for its arrival here at the museum. Now I'm gonna see if I can get you to, if this will play. Let's see if we can get it to work because this is an intro to our next acquisition. This journey is made possible by the annual financial support from leaders like you. Most of you will recognize this introduction. So, I had to, I'm sorry, I had to do that to get out of that. We'll go back into the presentation in a second. So I can get back to that, that screen. Here we go. We'll go back down. Always the problem of actually playing a video within your presentation. It doesn't always connect perfectly after you do it. But what I, no, don't do that. <laughs> it's, trying to, it's trying to get me past that again. So let's see. So I'm gonna go to the, I'm gonna go back to that again and I'm gonna get past it this time. <laughs> you would think that they would make it a lot easier to do this. And of course they are not. Okay, here we go. Hey, got it, finally. <laughs> okay, so what you just watched was the introduction to Mystery, the PBS series. And what you were looking at are the designs of Edward Gorey, the famous uh, illustrator. And here's a, one of his books here in this image. He was known to do this really bizarre, very dark uh, illustration work. It was both used uh, in poster and postcards and in a whole series of books, both for adults and for children uh, of weird things happening to people, people dying, disappearing, sucked into holes. I mean, all the kind of weird things you can think of. Uh, and something we always wanted for our wonderful collection 
of uh, sort of cartoon and comic book art was an original work by Gorey. And we were able this past year to purchase this work at left, Edward Gorey, the deflow deflowered by a famous crooner from his book shown on the right, uh, the recently deflowered girl, the right thing to say on every dubious occasion. And so this is really neat uh, because uh, Gorey's works are hard to get a hold of and his, the creepiest of his works are really expensive and hard for, hard for an institution like us to acquire because a lot of our money is not allowed to be used for works like this. Um, so uh, at left, you can see this illustration and this book of dubious occasions is all about very weird and strange and uh, circumstances. This one has a uh, sexual nature to it in terms of the story is that a famous crooner comes to town and uh, has a little mini affair with this young woman and signs something to her and then denies that. And so she confronts him when she sees him next time. And, and he says, well, no, I never signed that piece of paper to you. And well, she says, well, then will you actually give me a real, uh, you know, a real signature? Uh, because he's denying this in front of all her girlfriends. So uh, really a fun little thing, uh, but it was great to get this original illustration and it's gonna actually be going up soon in a line exhibition to talk about uh, how artists use line to create uh, artwork and how that connects to other exhibitions going on in the museum. So just a really neat thing for us to, uh, uh, to add to the uh, comic and cartoon collection, which many of you may know is really fine we have a lot of illustrations for things like Batman, Superman, and other things in this collection. So this is an, a great new addition uh, for that. Uh, for the Bauhaus exhibition, which we had this past year, uh, we acquired a lot of new work for our collection to build a Bauhaus uh, collection at our museum, which we never really had before. And this is important because many of you may know the museum was expanded in 1970, more than doubled in size by the famous Bauhaus architect, Walter Gropius. But the museum never had a huge collection of work relating to that movement. And over the past two years, we've added to it. And this most recent, one, recent piece, which we added just a few months ago, is this wonderful bronze sculpture left by Zoe Green Mercier called Untitled. And she is shown in the photo at right with one of her larger exhibitions uh, where she won the, uh, uh, the Grand Prix International. Um, she was a woman artist who joined the new Bauhaus in Chicago and studied there and did a lot of work early on uh, using a collage. And we have one of those works in the collection um, right now is in addition to the sculpture. And those collages were layers of paper and fiber and other material layered through pieces of glass. Uh, which are really neat, and we have one of those. But she later went on to become this famous sort of abstract sculptor working in bronze. And we really wanted one of her bronzes. And a few months ago, this one showed, turned up in a sale and we were able to, uh, uh, to purchase it and add it to the collection. And that's, it's really cool because uh, building this collection uh, is really a great connection for the museum since we're one of the only museums ever brought to completion by Gropius. And so as we grow this collection over the years, uh, we're gonna be able to do more and more installations of different displays of art based on the whole idea of the Bauhaus, which connects directly to our master artist program and our studio program, because Gropius wanted the museum to be an institution that used those principles of studio teaching and uh, to teach artists how to produce artwork and be part of the world. So again, this really neat sculpture, very glad to have it here in the collection. Going back to our idea of, of growing our West Virginia collection, because again, like the Bauhaus collection, there was never a big interest at our museum of having West Virginia artwork. And so this is a great piece, which we just purchased uh, by George Adamit called West Virginia Hillside. It dates to 1930. It's really a wonderful image, uh, very bright and colorful. And in the black and white photo at left is shown the artist. Uh, Adam Meat was a Cleveland-based businessman and artist. He actually ran a very successful printing company, but he was one of the founders of the Cleveland 
um, Society of Artists and exhibited at the Cleveland Museum of Art no less than 40 times during his career, if, if memory serves. And believe it or not, we wanted to own this painting several years ago, it came up at an auction, and we tried to buy it and we didn't get it. So we were really disappointed. A few years went by and I got an email from a gallery saying they had this painting and they were wanted to sell it. So we immediately reached out to which they said it's on hold for somebody else. And we were like, darn it, I can't, we can't believe we're gonna miss this painting again. But then a few days later, we got a note from them saying uh, the person had decided against it. So if we wanted it, we could buy it now. And we immediately snapped it up. And we were so quick in our processing of this acquisition through our committee structure that we forgot to alert the gallery, even though we had it on hold. And so they wrote us back and said, so do you know what you're gonna do about this painting? And we said, oops, we're sorry. We've actually already mailed you the check. We are acquiring it. So uh, it was really funny circumstance, but it's just a beautiful painting and a very positive view of West Virginia. We're always trying to acquire works of West Virginia, which are beautiful views or, or are super historical and enhance our understanding of the state. So this is a great one. Uh, you may see it on the cover of our next magazine because that's where I want to put it. Um, so it's, it's just really a wonderful work. Up next is, is a great painting, one of two we acquired this uh, in recent months by Stan Sporney. Uh, those of you who have been in Huntington a long time will remember Stan is one of the uh, most wonderful painting instructors at uh, Marshall University who died very suddenly at a young age, uh, more than a decade ago now, I believe. And the museum never had any of Stan Sporney's artwork in our collection until about two years ago when uh, uh, one of his Ohio River landscapes was given to the museum. Um, but we had always really, really wanted um, a work from his series of uh, the Mardi Gras, which he did during his career and which were really popular. And a few months ago, two huge paintings by Stan from the series, including this one, came up for auction and we were able to buy both of them for the collection. This one, which is called Ribbon Ruckus, Ruckus, Ruckus is one of them. Uh, it's really wonderful. And what's fun about these paintings and what we will know, but nobody else will, is that while they are Mardi Gras themed, the buildings in the background are Third Avenue in Huntington. Uh, so it's, it's a connection between our city and also uh, the tradition of having Mardi Gras in New Orleans. So we're really excited uh, to have the two paintings. Uh, this one is the G-rated painting. The other one is not so G-rated. G -rated. Uh, it's got um, a lot of topless women in it. So that one you'll have to come to the museum to see in person, uh, but I'm not gonna show it here. Uh, but anyway, as I said, we're really excited because these are, are huge paintings. They're I think 40 by 70, something like that. But they're great additions to our collection because Stan um, who studied in Philadelphia and was really extremely well known uh, nationally and internationally, um, uh, we're going to actually feature for a, a major retrospective in about a year or two of his paintings here at the museum, working with his family. So, I mean, he was super important, not only to uh, uh, the art world in America, but also to the university, where uh, if you know anything about his students, um, even to this day, they worship Stan. As, as a, a teacher of painting. And he really was one of the best painters to ever come and work in Huntington, West Virginia. So we're really happy to have this one. Come and see them both uh, when, when we show them at the museum in the near future. This is my final slide for day, today because I wanna leave a lot of time for questions because I know you guys always have lots of good questions. This is a portrait of Charles Duvenek at left as a young boy by his brother who's shown at the right, Frank Duvenek, who is the fame, one of the most famous art teachers in American history. He taught at the Cincinnati Art Academy uh, in Cincinnati, which produced some of the great artists of the 20th century and continues to be a force today as an instructional institution. While we had a small work by Duvenek in the collection, we were really looking for something really special by him for the collection. And we were connected, we were actually reached out to by a gallery in, in Columbus uh, a few months ago that had this wonderful painting shown at left, this sort of touching portrait of 
his young baby brother that Frank du Dubinick did when he himself was a very young artist. And we sort of fell in love with it and saw it as a great connection to works like Kathleen, our, our painting that we have in the collection by Robert uh, uh, on Rye, um, where Kathleen, we always had a connection to the subject in the painting. And we felt in this work, we had a connection more directly to Duvenek. It wasn't some unknown portrait. It was this very sensitive painting that he did of his little brother. Um, and what was really nice about it is it descended in Duvenek's estate until around 1920, when it was bought by a family in Columbus, and it stayed until that fam in that family until we purchased it. So that's really special to have a, a connection to a work like this. And it was filthy dirty. You're seeing it actually in its finished state, having been cleaned and conserved. And uh, we're going to be very excited to see this wonderful portrait up at the museum in the near future uh, as a great example by Duvenek with that wonder fa wonderful family connection. And as I said, you know, we've had that connection in the painting by Kathleen we have. We had that connection in uh, one of our British portraits that we own, where we are connected to the family of the person in it. So having these connections takes portraits we own to another level. It's not like just some random portrait in the collection. It, it provides a special uh, you know, connection. Um, so that is my last slide as my presentation, but I want to leave a ton of time to go back to talk about other images uh, that your uh, members may have today, because I know we had some wonderful discussions last time. So I'm going to open that uh, up to the floor, and uh, I'm going to be ready to go backwards and forwards anywhere you want in this um, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, most of you are muted, so I can't hear you. I don't think anybody else can, so. I said you may unmute, unmute yourself, so you, you may ask questions and uh, participate in the discussion. Yes. I just received uh, a notice of the uh, Blanche Lazelle uh, exhibition. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, let me go back up to the front here where we have one of the Lazelles in an image here. So here is Blanche Lazelle at the far right here, the still life. Blanche Lazelle is probably our most famous export as an artist. Um, you know, raised in West Virginia, she studied on the East Coast. She became very involved with the Provincetown uh, art colony. And the show that we're gonna that just opened up this past weekend is really special because it does include a couple of the pieces that the museum itself owns, but includes two a large group of works that are owned by Lazelle's descendants, which haven't been shown before. So these include woodblock prints uh, and paintings, which are really wonderful. Um, Lazelle, you know, she originally was a typical American impressionist painter. But after her, the experience of the, uh, the great modern art exhibition held in New York at the Armory in 1913 uh, begins to change. And you'll see this in this work we have here in this slide uh, where her work is getting a lot more abstract away and the, more like the work of Seurat where you're using you know, little dots of paint to create the painting, you know, the pointillistic approach. But after her visit in the 1920s, to Paris and her studies there, her work goes very abstract and much more uh, relating to cubism uh, and, and other types of movements such as that. And we're very lucky that there are uh, several prints uh, in the exhibition that's up right now uh, that sort of feature that style. There's also a, a wonderful painting, uh, actually a, a beautiful still life, which if you compared it to this one, it's totally cubist. It doesn't look anything like this. Um, there's also a wonderful painting, probably of the buildings in Provincetown, which is much more uh, relating to uh, modernism and cubism uh, in general. So I encourage you to come see that exhibition because she is so famous and, um, and known nationally and internationally uh, as being one of the super artists who came from West Virginia. I actually wish we could have more of her works in our collection. 
uh, but she is so famous that her works tend to be very expensive and hard for us to uh, chase after. There are some of her prints, in particular, her wonderful white line woodblock prints, which the rarest of which can cost upwards of a quarter million dollars, which is just something that we can't afford here at the museum. Uh, but we're lucky enough to have one of her still life prints in our collection. And we're lucky enough to be, to be able to show in this exhibition, several different uh, types of woodblock prints, as well as paintings and drawings. So I do encourage you to come and see it. Uh, uh, she's a wonderful artist. Jeff, I'm interested in the, um, the china because I am a collector of lots of china patterns and crystal. And sure. I had no idea. I know that we had glass factories, but I did not know about this, um, this china. Um, so, so did Mrs. Pretty handle all the orders for it or was, did her uh, family own the company? Can you, do you, can you tell us a little more about that? And do you have any other pieces at the museum? I don't know the answer to the first part of your question. My belief is she was one of the owners of the company, that her family okay. owned the, this company. Um, this, of course, being a sample would not have been something that went out in the open market. This would have right. been something that you would go and see in the showroom, the factory and say, well, I want the rose, that rose pattern, 506. That's what I want to order. Um, oh, I see the we, pattern numbers even, yeah. Yes, the pattern numbers run around the rim to match the actual patterns. and. Uh, there were actually a number of different ceramic factories in Huntington in addition to glass factories. I, it is not an area I'm that strong on in terms of my familiarity, familiarity with that. The, there were many that were actually very shortly lived that sort of tried to make a success of it but couldn't. Um, so we have a number of pieces in the collection from different ceramic factories that were in Huntington. Not all of those will be represented in the Huntington show because the Huntington show is, is more about artwork versus uh, history, even though it will have some history aspects to it, uh, but it will have glass pieces and some ceramic pieces that relate to the history of Huntington because Huntington was always a big manufacturing uh, town. We had a number of, of successful uh, glass factories for a long time, such as Pilgrim uh, and others you know, uh, here in our region. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this plate I thought was particularly interesting because of it showing how, you know, today, we go on Amazon and we order our stuff. But back in the day, you would have had to take a, either use a catalog or you would go to the showroom to look at the samples and really hold it and decide you liked it. I mean, for those of you who are old enough, remember when you used to go to a record store and sit in a booth and listen to a record to decide if you wanted to buy it. I mean, just the, the idea of how different the world is today compared to then on how uh, uh, a retail or mercantile company would get its wares out there. Uh, another good example in Huntington was uh, the enormous frame company that we had here in Huntington uh, uh, that, uh, that sold its frames around the world to other companies to retail, um, uh, as well as framed prints for companies around the country. Um, so. Uh, it, it really is an interesting subject that's worthy of more study. I don't know of a good resource on all the different um, manufacturing companies that, that existed in Huntington. Questions? There, there was a um, small piece and I think the artist's name was Linda, but it looks very much like the statue that is standing outside. Yeah, that's it. Um, Linda Benglis, that's standing outside the museum um, of the bird. Is that the same artist? Um, no, it is, it, it is not. Uh, we don't have a large exterior paint, uh, sculpture by Linda Benglis. She's really known for these sort of uh, using a, a lot of different materials that, uh, like this one, which would not be good for putting outside. Um, so this one as being like uh, like a, uh, a mixed media using, I think, I'm pretty sure this has got felt involved in it, different colored felts to create this, this sculpture, which hangs on a wall. It doesn't stand uh, sort of vertically on its own as a three-dimensional object. Um, 
So uh, the, the sculptures in front of the museum, I'm trying to think of, uh, there's of course the large one uh, that sits in right in front of the museum, which is by a New York State artist called The Ruins. And there's also a, a number of other contemporary works uh, out front, um, but nothing by Linda Bangless. Again, right. she's, she's particularly noted. And I wonder if we would even be able to afford an outdoor sculpture by her. Uh, one of the sad things is a lot of our money, the way it's restricted, doesn't allow us to buy outdoor sculpture most of the time. Many of the sculptures on the museum grounds were bought at a time when the federal government helped to fund those purchases, which they no longer do. So for us to buy a very interesting or important outdoor sculpture is very difficult these days. But again, we'd love to do that. Um, we love outdoor sculpture on the grounds because when the museum isn't open, you can come around and do the trails and also see the wonderful outdoor sculptures that are that are located throughout the facility. So, thank you. Speaking of uh, the trails, Jeff, could you give us an update on you know the museum suffered a lot of damage during the ice storm? Are the trails back open, up and running? Um, are you? They back are they are back open. Uh, they still have a lot of debris on the areas that are 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 not actual the trails, but um, uh, the, yeah, the ice storm did a lot of damage, but uh, thankfully none of the artwork on the trails were damaged. So you can go see the wonderful uh, hidden sculptures all over the trail system, which are still in place. Um, and the trails is actually an area where we'd love to add more um, nature themed sculpture to, uh, because it was, it was always meant to have sculpture on it. And uh, while we have a, a group right now, there's always a possibility if funding were available to put more wonderful sculptures uh, along the trail system, so. And can you also touch on the museum? How open is the museum? How do you come to the museum? Do you still need to make a reservation? Uh, until the end of June, it's, it's open. You've got to get a free ticket and reservation online. But beginning July 1, we're back open our, on our normal schedule. Uh, so anybody can come. We'll be open late on, late on Tuesdays till 8 p.m. as we used to be. Uh, and open just our normal IRs after July 1. You won't need a reservation or a ticket. Uh, so we're very excited about that. We don't see doing any large scale programming until the fall when we're gonna reintroduce our normal class schedule and allow larger tour groups to participate in the museum. Uh, we've been very proud of the way we've handled things at the museum during the pandemic, that not a single infection can be blamed on the museum and not a single staff member or volunteer or trustee got sick as you know, part of their involvement at the museum uh, with anything we did. So we are really happy about that. That was our goal. And we're very happy we were successful in achieving that. Great accomplishment, absolutely. Um, other questions or comments? We have about a half hour left. Will there be, okay, you're open. You're on. Be a uh, the book sale this year, or is that going to be put off? Yes, the book sale will be the first large event held in the studios. Uh, it's at the end of August, and it will be enormous because we've been storing two years of books. So please, when you come, you're not allowed to buy a book or two books. Please come and buy a box or two of books uh, because there are an enormous number of books to get rid of this year so that we can start storing all the books which will start coming the day after the book sale is over. Um, so, but um, I think the quality is going to be very good at the book sale because we've been much stricter in curating the books that we've taken this past year because we had to store two years worth of them. Um, so I think the, the overall quality is far superior to any year previously. And the community has missed that, uh, the book sale. Yes, yes. It, it, it should be really good. Are you looking for any special art at this point? You've acquired a lot of new art and you have restrictions, but is there anything that your heart desires and that you're looking around going to auctions for? Um, yes, I would say the, the piece we would, in my mind, that we would really kill to have right now would be a work by the contemporary African-American painter, Kehinde Wiley. Um, okay. You may know his work 
Um, what he does is he takes African-American subjects and depicts them in the way of a wealthy and famous white people from the past. So, you know, wearing a crown as a monarch or on a horse or really super positive and powerful depictions of African-American people. His paintings though, even on the auction market are very expensive. I mean, really you're talking 150 to $300,000. But to get one of those would be a real coup for the museum because he's, he is extraordinarily important and he is only going to get more important and harder to acquire uh, as his career continues. And um, so uh, it, would be, uh, it would be really, really neat. Uh, let me see if I can, um, let me see if I can find an image I can steal and quickly paste into this PowerPoint and I'll bring the PowerPoint back up. And uh, let me see if I can do that. Whoa. Okay, yes. Let me relaunch the show. Okay. And I'm going to show you. Oops, went too far. Hold on a second. Okay. And. So, can everybody see that? That is, a, that is a Candy Wiley painting. Um, so he does this one, he does these wonderful patterned backgrounds based on historic uh, you know, designs, such as period wallpapers. And then he portrays, uh, here you're seeing a African-American male, young male figure portrayed as an artist, sort of holding almost like a, almost like a baton in a book, probably based on an image of a let's say a, a French general in the 18th or the 17th century. So they're hyper-realistic paintings, they're huge works. They're often pretty close to life size. Um, and so we would love to have one of these. Uh, and, but like I said, they are really, really expensive. But he is about as important as a contemporary painter could be in America and the world right now. And he's only going to get more important as time goes on. So finding some donors that would love to give us the kind of money to buy a painting by this artist uh, would be really great because it's not the kind of work that's ever going to be donated to us. We just don't have that population in our region who, collect, who can afford to collect these kind of works. These works are really collected you know, uh, in the wealthiest circles, so. What's his name again? What would you say his name again? Yeah, Hindi Wiley. So his first name is K-E-H-I-N-D-E, -E. last name W-I-L-E-Y. And he is the one who painted uh, President Obama's formal por presidential portrait, which is at the National Portrait Gallery. So uh, really a superb artist. So you would have had to have been able to acquire his paintings before that but for them to be at all um, even be no, even before that, they were very expensive. Like we we keep watching several. They come up at auction quite, quite regularly, and if we had you know, you know, a quarter million dollars, we could get one. There's no question we could get one, but we need a quarter million dollars to do that, <laughs> and that's not easy for us to come by, because most of the acquisition funds at the museum are restricted to older paintings, and this being a contemporary work it's really hard for us to piece together the, the funding to acquire. Would you comment a bit on uh, whether it's traditional for museum acquisition donations usually to be uh, set for historic or past old masters or, and not for current or modern art? Um, sure, every museum is different. It all is based on what your donors are interested in. So when the Wheeler, 
the Wheelers established the trust that benefits the museum, which is the largest source of acquisition funds. They were particular, particularly interested in improving the museum's holdings of pre-1940 paintings. So that could be paintings from the Renaissance, could be paintings from, uh, you know, from the early 20th century, it could be painting, it could be British portraits from the 18th century. So that was their interest. But other donors like Donald Harper, our former docent who left a very significant gift to the museum, he didn't care. He wanted us to buy any kind of art, you know, paintings or artwork that we wanted. So his fund doesn't have a restriction other than it has to be used to buy art for the collection. So it's all about what a donor is interested in. Now, many of those gifts were made after uh, the decease of people such as Don Harper and it was after their passing away. I sort of would hope that one day we would get a donor who would give us a large fund at the museum while they were alive to buy our work so that they could enjoy what was being selected and being involved in the process. Because there's nothing more fun than being part of that process of saying, yeah, yeah, let's buy that. And then coming to the museum and standing in front of me and saying, wow, I love that we bought this. I think the, the, the saddest thing about bequests at, you know, that happen at the end of somebody's life is that person who made it happen doesn't get any of the benefit. They don't get to participate in whatever it is they were funding, whether it's buying artwork or funding a children's program or building an addition or, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, I mean, I like Julius Rosenwald's statement He's the, he was one of the founders of Sears, uh, who also funded all of the construction of African-American schools in the South. And his quote was, give while you live so that you can be part of it, the success of what you're giving towards. And so um, I, I think it's so much more fun to be part of the process when you were a donor than to have missed it entirely, you know, so. Like I said, if anybody wants to help me buy one of these paintings, got a, got a little money to spare, I'm, we're ready to go. <laughs> uh, this is Jane McKee. I just wanted to uh, comment and ask you if you saw a recent um, New York Magazine that had uh, the art of Winfred Rembert, who had passed away and he did chain gangs. And he had been in prison and he learned this tool kind of, uh, um, I, I don't know, some process that he did these. And they are just amazing. And um, I, I hope that you'll see that. I'll have to take a look for it. I don't know off the top of my head, but there's a whole um, collecting area of uh, prison art, art created by prisoners, whether it be paintings or sculpture or folk art or self-taught art. Uh, it's really an interesting topic and has been featured in museum exhibitions in the United States, uh, whether regionally or nationally. Um, I don't, I think we have a couple pieces by artists uh, in our collection that were created when they were in prison, not a lot, it might be two or three, um, but that's a whole area that people study and write about and collect from, which I think is, is super interesting because so many of them are self-taught. They may yes. not have been artists before they went in, but they're in for such a long period of time for it because of whatever crime they committed that they decide to take it up as something and either learn to be really professional and proficient or tend to be more on the sort of self-taught folk art side of it, where it's a little more primitive in style, but still extremely interesting. And that's been going on for a long time. There are there are prison systems in the United States that did in the past have gift shops and they feature the art created by prisoners in their prisons. There's only a few that still do it, I think, but in the past, that used to be a way that those prisons would make money for the prison, is that the, that artwork would go out to be sold and it would benefit the prison, not the prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you'll find a lot of work done way back, sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s that were created as part of that process. So really, really an interesting subject and one that's worthy of uh, exhibition in museums. 
Uh, I think Mr. Rembrandt did his after he had been in prison to deal with his memories and the and the trauma and all of sure. it. And uh, uh, they are just very moving, uh, very uh, very moving. So I hope you'll look. Definitely, I will. Um, I have a question about the um, the Huntington um, bus that you talked about. So, is the museum uh, is this in part is this in conjunction with the Huntington's hundred fiftieth anniversary, or is it just something the museum has already? And are you part of this celebration coming up? Um, we are part of that celebration in terms of <coughs> we were asked if we could if we were going to do something, and we decided we would do this show because we rarely ever in our history have featured Huntington art. And uh, we have a book coming out that'll be out actually in a few weeks on uh, the artists of Huntington, West Virginia. It's basically a, a project that I got sucked into in my spare time, the little that I have, of course, uh, uh, a couple of years ago where my grant writer was trying to work on a grant and he wanted to talk about how Huntington has always been an artistic community, always been, uh, a community that had artists involved in it. And I said to him, I don't think there is a resource on that because he was asking me if I knew anything. And so he looked at me and he said, well, you should get on that. And so two years later, we have this giant hardcover book coming out. It's actually just about to go to press probably this week, which has, it's basically a biographical dictionary of roughly 600 artists that have lived and worked in, lived in Huntington since 1871 to the present. So it sort of takes you through the history. It's, it's not a book to sort of read the way you would read a novel. It does have an introductory essay and section about art in Huntington. But then after that, it's basically a biographical dictionary organized alphabetically. And then it features uh, works from the museum's collection of a selection of those artists whose biographies are included as part of the book. And there's really a lot of interesting artists uh, who have worked in Huntington. Uh, the book is restricted to artists who had, they had to have lived in Huntington at some point. So they've been born here, came and lived here. Uh, that way uh, uh, it could give us a real sense of who was here. And uh, there were a lot of artistic businesses in Huntington that drew artists in. The ceramic factories, the glass factories, the frame making factories. Uh, and uh, many of them continued on from there and had their own careers or got involved in other artistic pursuits after working on those. So I think it'll be really interesting for people and be a great reference when people stumble across a painting in Huntington and say, I know that name, it's in that book. And they can learn about who that person was. So oh. um, it, it, it should be really neat to have that in conjunction with this exhibition, which is coming up. Um, from going to press to actually have it in your hands, will that do you anticipate that being? Yeah, it'll be exciting. I think if we go to press this week in about six weeks, we'll have it. So that'll be sort of, you know, end of July, maybe. So it would be sold just at the museum or around town? Um, it'll places? be sold Amazon? at the museum and we're hoping to feature it at a couple different stores uh, around town as well. Glad to see that. Other questions or comments? We just have a few minutes. Elizabeth, this is Jane again. This is just for you. Okay. Uh, every, every few months, could we just have Mr. Fleming back on <laughs> he's so, he's so wonderful, and I would just love to see him be a regular. Oh, he needs to be a, a, a an honorary member of our, our of our group, which I think we could actually do. That's a question for Mr. Fleming. We could have, um, you know, as he's putting things together, if he would want to come and do a bonus talk whenever he would like to reach out to us and share something with us. It doesn't have to be an hour and a half. We would certainly uh, entertain that idea. Not to put uh, Jeff on the spot or anything. I know he puts a lot of time into these slides, but you know, if he wants to hop on every now and then for a half hour, 45 minutes, we certainly would, would entertain that, wouldn't we, group? So um, if Mr. Fleming would like to do that, we would we will we will have it anytime we can get him. And we are hoping to open back up in September. Diane, are we still on on target for that for our, our September meeting to be in person? It makes perfect sense. Uh, I think the okay. world is opening. I think most of our members will have been immunized. Um, 
and I think people are really anxious to be back and see humans, you know, in the flesh. Yeah. So <laughs> what we also could do is uh, in the fall schedule um, in conjunction with the, the museum, a time that we could come up and have a special uh, uh, tour with the museum. Jeff, would that be a possible? We give you enough advance notice. Yes, and it would be nice because then you'll be able to see the, um, the Huntington show opens. When does it open? It opens September 18th. Oh, so okay. it'll be up September 18th to the beginning of January. So doing something in the fall where you can see that show and you'll be able to see at the same time that you come to see that. Uh, if, you, if we do it sort of, uh, let me see here. If we do something uh, in September, you'll be able to see the Wheeler Trust show. You'll be able to see the Bogle show, the American painting show and the Sesquicentennial show. So all those will be up and we'll connect to this talk that I've done today for all of you, so. Well, let's, we'll find a time um, to come up in September. It sounds like that would be a really good month to and kind of kick off being, you know, back open and back together. So we'll talk about that as a group and then um, find a time with you. Is there, a, before we get into our discussions off outside of this uh, discussion, is there a day or time that you have that's more open to, to schedule something like this? That we can be thinking of a later date. No, I mean it should be it should be pretty easy in terms of scheduling something. Once we're open, we'll we'll work with Cindy to coordinate having a group come up. That's who's going to have to coordinate it. But there isn't necessarily a better you know okay time of day. Well, we, we'll just get together as a group and decide a good time. Well, do we any uh, party comments or or questions? Before we've got about ten minutes. If you need to squeeze something in. I think it's been a great discussion and um, loved the presentation, Jeff. And each time you give us that kind of information, it really enforces the feeling that we are so lucky to have the Huntington Museum of Art here and we're so lucky to have you guiding it. Thank you. Absolutely. The Jewel of Huntington with a fantastic director. Does it get any better? I don't think the, so. The, the collection here is, is really special. And I think a lot of people overlook it remembering that, that the city of this size has a collection of this quality in it. I mean, it is, it is really amazing. And it's something that we tell people all the time because you, know, you get that look of like, could there be something that good in West Virginia? They can't believe it, uh, but there is. And uh, so we're gonna continue to you know, hold great exhibitions and acquire as many wonderful things as we can to keep our collection on top uh, in our state.